Before they got mixed up in a $300 million international scandal, David Pakus and Ephraim Deveroli were just a couple of kids from Miami Beach. They met at Beth Israel Congregation, the largest Orthodox synagogue in the area. However, their religion was about the only thing they had in common. Pakus was a skinny kid who always wore his yarmulke, but wasn't particularly sure of himself or his place in the world. On the other hand, Deveroli, who was four years younger than Pakus, was an overweight, loudmouth class clown who always made his presence known and felt. Perhaps it was their drastically different temperament that ultimately drew the two together. After school, they'd head down to the beach where they'd smoke some pot, play some music, and engage in the kind of shenanigans akin to the typical teenager. As Pakuza's high school years came to a close, his indecisiveness about what to do with his life became painfully clear. He enrolled at the University of Florida, but spent his first few semesters drifting aimlessly without an obvious direction. Paku spent most of his time with his high school buddies doing the kinds of things they always did, getting high, making music, and trying their best to ignore the constraints of everyday life. Although a slacker at heart, Pakuz wasn't without his aspirations. He had dreams of becoming a world-famous rock star. He knew the odds were not in his favor. Still, he had no intention of wasting his life away, flipping burgers or trapped inside a cubicle. Deveroli had no such problems. His destiny, it seems, was determined before he was even born. He was going to be an arms dealer, like his father before him. It's a good thing he had a family business to fall back on, too, because he got himself kicked out of school in the ninth grade. Instead of spending his formative teenage years sleeping through English class, Deveroli moved to Los Angeles to learn under the wing of his arms dealer uncle. By his 16th birthday, he was hawking weapons, ammunition, and other military paraphernalia in foreign lands. In 2001, Deveroli and his uncle had a falling out, prompting him to pack his bags and move back across the country to his old Miami stomping grounds. It was then that he took over his father's shell company, AEY Inc., and took his first steps into the arms business by himself. Before we delve into Deveroli's first solo venture as an arms dealer, let's talk about the state of the arms trade in the early 2000s. Throughout George W. Bush's tenure as U.S. president, private military contracts became more prevalent. With the onset of war in the Middle East, the U.S government turned to private contractors to get their hands on weapons at an unprecedented rate. There's a reason these contracts ballooned from $145 billion to $390 billion under President Bush. U.S. law requires that every Pentagon purchase order be made available to public bidding. This gave the Department of Defense access to the seemingly infinite well of the international arms aftermarket through independent contractors. Eastern European countries stockpiled weapons, preparing for a war with the West during the Cold war era. When war no longer seemed imminent, arms dealers got a hold of these warehouses filled with munitions, which they set out to sell to the highest bidder. The US government obviously couldn't get involved with these shady dealers, at least not directly. For that reason, they relied on contractors to do their dirty work. Instead of paying an arms dealer, the Department of Defense paid a middleman to do business with arms dealers. That's why the arms trade was dubbed a kind of gray market. There was undoubtedly a criminal element to the whole operation. However, with the help of independent contractors like Deveroli, the U.S. government could still get the supplies they needed for the militias they were forming in Iraq and Afghanistan. As long as the weapons were flowing, they didn't really care how their contractors conducted business, save for a couple of key exceptions. There was an embargo on munitions from China, and the State Department also banned doing business with a particular Russian firm called Rosoboron, who allegedly sold nuclear equipment to Iran. After taking control of AEY, Deveroli took advantage of the burgeoning arms aftermarket that was only being helped by the developing war. However, the company wasn't a top-shelf operation in its early stages. Deveroli rented a modest room from a family's house in Miami and essentially ran AEY from the comfort of his bedroom. He was a self-taught, self-starter who quickly became well-versed in the complicated language commonly used throughout federal contracts such as those he started bidding on. At this point, AEY was a no-name small business competing with massive corporations like Lockheed Martin and BAE Systems. But what Deveroli lacked in infrastructure, he certainly made up for in no-holds-barred ambition. His company's lack of overhead also allowed him to run a lean operation with very few extraneous expenses. This made it possible for him to undercut his top competitors on bids. He typically dealt with smaller contracts, but even so, he was accumulating a proven record of past performance, which is something the Pentagon was looking for in its prospective contractors. Pacuz became aware of Deveroli's career path and how it proved quite lucrative for his old stoner buddy. The two ran into each other one day. Deveroli invited Pacuz to accompany him to a party thrown by a local rabbi. It was there that Deveroli told his old friend all about his work and how he just secured a $15 million contract with the Pentagon. 
Hakuz was intrigued, and Deveroli indicated that his ever-increasing workload made it harder for him to run AEY by himself. Hakuz then asked him how much money he'd made in the arms trade, expecting him to say something in the ballpark of uh, 100000 Deveroli pulled his car over and looked his friend directly into the eyes when he said he'd made $1.8 million in cash. That was all Pacuz needed to hear. Deveroli had his new business partner right then and there. Even with Pacuz, who was made account executive, the operation remained relatively lean. The two sat across from one another in Deveroli's one-bedroom apartment, and after getting themselves good and stoned, they'd get to work bidding on federal contracts. Deveroli was a natural-born charmer, using his charisma and business skills to leverage the Pentagon's buyers, aka soldiers without a lick of business experience. This meant he could convince the State Department to accept cheaper weapons after already signing a contract contract with AEY, increasing the company's profit margin exponentially. Seven months into Pacuz's involvement with AEY, he and Diveroli traveled to Paris for an international arms convention. It was there that the pair met Heinrich Thomas a Swiss arms dealer. He was stationed at a booth displaying a new robotic reconnaissance device. Tomet was a seasoned vet in the arms trade, which meant he had connections worldwide. With his intricate network of shell companies and offshore accounts, Tomet could get good prices on munitions while avoiding government scrutiny on his various business transactions. Despite his efforts to evade the feds, he'd recently come under investigation by U.S. law enforcement in connection to his illicit dealings, and he was on an official State Department watch list as a result. For that reason, he viewed AEY as a a perfect conduit through which he could go back to facilitating Pentagon contracts. With Tomet in tow, AEY was more profitable than ever. Then, in July of 2006, they finally got their big break. They came across the mother of all federal contracts while pursuing the usual government listings. It was a 44-page document detailing a semi-covert operation by the Bush administration to prop up the Afghan National Army. Based on the huge number of supplies the army was looking for, Deveroli knew it would be a massively profitable contract if they managed to bid on it successfully. It was the type of contract that a small-time operation like AEY normally wouldn't have a prayer of obtaining. However, President Bush recently enacted a small business initiative that stipulated a certain percentage of defense contracts go to smaller firms like AEY. Furthermore, the supply lines Tom had helped them set up made it possible for Pecuz and Deveroli to get in contact with the types of dealers necessary to meet the giant contract's demands. The contract's language also made it seem as though the Pentagon was wasn't particularly concerned with the quality of the ammunition so as long as it was serviceable. This meant AEY might be able to get away with delivering a low quality product as long as it shot out of the barrel like it was supposed to. Hakuz had to step up his game to get their hands on this contract. For the next six weeks, he worked tirelessly, day and night, calling every Eastern European arms manufacturer known to man, looking for stockpiles of weapons at reasonable prices. Deveroli wasn't sure whether he should calculate a 9 or 10% profit into their bid, while 1% may not seem like much to write home about, that one measly percent was a $3 million difference. He ultimately settled on 9%, which came out to a total bid of nearly $300 million. In the end, that was enough for them to undercut the big boys and win the bid, making Pacuz and Diveroli, who were still in their early 20s, responsible for one of the Bush administration's biggest arms deals. Overnight, they became a pivotal aspect of the U.S. government's entire foreign policy. Hakuz was saddled with the brunt of the workload. This daunting assignment would have normally taken dozens of experienced employees to complete, but he believed he was up to the task. While Diveroli was off in Eastern Europe looking for suppliers, Hakuz headed to Abu Dhabi to attend an annual international defense exhibition. He hoped to find one supplier big enough to meet the majority of AEY's various needs for their $300 million contract. The obvious candidate was the Russian arms behemoth Rosoborin, but, as you might remember, they were blacklisted by the U.S. government. But Rosoborin sold more than 90% of Russia's weapons, making them the perfect fit for what AEY was trying to accomplish. Pakuz just had to keep their Russian association on the down low. He managed to get in front of Rosoborn's deputy director to make his pitch. The Russians seemed to be interested in what AEY had going on, and it looked as though the two parties were going to work out a deal. Several weeks after his meeting with the Russians, Pakuz learned that AEY was barred from flying over the former Soviet satellite Turkmenistan, which they had to cross to get the arms to Afghanistan. It appeared the Russians were screwing with their new business partner, perhaps in some backward attempt to get themselves off of the U.S. blacklist. Pakuz had to obtain overflight permission from Ukraine instead. 
The largest facet of AEY's Afghan defense contract was the millions of AK-47 rounds they agreed to provide. While they had several ammo supplier options, they ultimately landed on Albanian contacts they had gotten from Tomit. Their decision largely stemmed from the fact that the Albanians didn't require massive down payments, and Albania's government was more than capable of handling the large volume AEY required. De Viroli sent another one of his old synagogue buddies, Alex Padriski, to broker the deal with the Albanians. However, upon his arrival in the capital city, Tirana, Padriski noticed some alarming details that indicated AEY's Albanian deal might be more trouble than they bargained for. First of all, they weren't exactly concerned with safety. Podriski watched in horror as soldiers lit cigarettes in a room overflowing with gunpowder. The rounds themselves were also being stored in rusty sardine cans and stacked on rotten wood, which wasn't exactly an encouraging sight. But the most concerning aspect of the Albanians' operation was the Chinese lettering on the ammunition's packaging. This was bad news all around. Not only had the U.S. government placed an embargo on the sale of Chinese weapons, but the Afghan contract explicitly prohibited the use of any Chinese munitions. With the contract's deadline fast approaching, Takuz and Divaroli had no time to look for another supplier for their AK-47 ammo. They had to circumvent the rules. They had to improvise. They instructed Podriski to get the ammunition repackaged in Albania. Their friend managed to track down a cardboard box manufacturer named Costa Trebica. Trebica was willing and able to repack the 100 million rounds of ammunition by transferring them from the metal sardine cans to fresh cardboard boxes. He thought the request was more than a little strange. Podriski told him they just wanted to, to lighten the load to save money on air freight. Although it seemed like AEY was in the clear, greed ultimately got the better of them. Divaroli had grown suspicious that Tomit was ripping them off. He believed Tomit was charging a higher rate than was necessary to broker the Albanians and pocketing the difference. Divaroli's suspicions were correct, and he tried to cut Tomit out of the deal. He called on Trebeka to strike a new deal with the Albanians that no longer included Tomit as a middleman. Divaroli's plan backfired. Tomit was paying a kickback fee to the Albanians off the books. He couldn't be kicked out of the deal. Trebeka ended up getting muscled out of the deal instead, and the Albanian mafia took over the repackaging effort. Despite the unforeseen complications, the shipment ultimately went through on time, and again, it seemed like AEY was in the clear. But with millions of dollars regularly being wired to his bank account, Divaroli once again let greed get the better of him. He approached Pakus about renegotiating their handshake deal. Divaroli wanted to give his business partner less money than they originally agreed read on. Hakuz, unfortunately, had no legal leg to stand on as he had not signed any contract with AEY. The two ultimately struck a new deal that awarded Pakus only a fraction of what he'd been initially promised. But he had plans to get back at Divaroli for his betrayal. He opened his own arms dealing firm called Dynacor Industries. He boasted on the company's website how his staff worked with the State Department, the Pentagon, and the Iraqi and Afghan armies in the past. As Pakus himself admitted, sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. Although the wedge between Pakus and Divaroli had brought their friendship to an end, they had far more pressing concerns than a lost friendship. Undercutting big business for the Afghan contract had made some serious enemies for AEY. One American arms dealer tipped off the government about the illegal shortcuts Pakus and Divaroli had taken to carry out the shipment. Federal agents subsequently raided Divaroli's offices where they came up with the damning emails he'd sent regarding the Chinese ammunition and the conspiracy to circumvent the embargo. At that point, there was nothing they could say or do to avoid the impending consequences. The jig was officially up. Although Divaroli and Pakus expressed remorse over their misdeeds, their apology wasn't enough to avoid punishment. Divaroli was sent to prison for four years, while Pakus was sent under house arrest for seven years. However, that wasn't the end of their time in the public spotlight. In 2016, Hollywood made a movie about their story called War Dogs. It starred Jonah Hill as Ephraim Divaroli and Miles Teller as David Pakus. That same year, Divaroli released a memoir titled Once a Gun Runner. He later sued Warner Brothers, War Dogs director Todd Phillips, producer Bradley Cooper, and others seeking to block the film's release. He claimed that they had used his memoir as the basis for the movie, despite not compensating him at all. Whatever the case may be, it seems that even even after supposedly paying his debts to society and learning his lesson, wherever Divaroli goes, trouble soon follows. Click here to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comments section whether or not you think guns should be legal or not.